Thanks a lot. Uh, we have a special treat today. Uh, many of you know Arik Asherman. He's been to Washington many times. Um, he is, I think, the preeminent voice uh, in Israel, uh, and he's known around the world for his uh, commitment to human rights. He is the uh, f former executive director, now the director of projects and programs for rabbis for human rights, uh, an Israeli organization that has kept the flame burning for a recognition and enforcement of human rights uh, in Israel for all Israelis uh, and for all uh, of those under Israeli governance. Uh, and uh, he speaks with great passion and wisdom on the synthesis between human rights and Judaism. Uh, he has thought and uh, written and spoken uh, regularly on the dilemmas that Israel faces, uh, on the debate over Israel as a Jewish state uh, and a democratic state. Uh, and today he's going to uh, uh, review those issues and talk about the challenges that uh, all of us are facing. The Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel, signed in 1948 and its founding document, commits Israel to, be, to becoming a Jewish and democratic state. Uh, that description was never elaborated, and there has been deep controversy over its meaning, indeed over the, the meaning of Zionism ever since. Uh, it was uh, primarily an internal debate uh, for many years. Now it has become part of the uh, political conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, in recent years, uh, governments of Israel have demanded that as a condition to making peace that the Palestinians uh, recognize and accept Israel as a, a, as a Jewish state. Uh, they have resisted that, saying that it's up to the a country itself to determine what it, wh wh how it characterizes itself and how, uh, and what it is called, but that has become an increasingly uh, emotionally contested issue. I hope Eric will dwell upon that. Uh, and what is the uh, the synthesis between the issues of Judaism, human rights, security? and sovereignty. So Eric, uh, welcome back. Great to have you. He had to get up at uh, four o'clock in the morning, but uh, we'll speak, Eric will speak for about 40, 30, 40 minutes, and there'll be plenty of time for, for Q's and A's. Eric Ashley. Okay, thank you. All right. So I'm gonna uh, not sit, uh, stand behind the podium. I'm gonna come out in front a little bit. I, I like to do that, I prefer that. Um, so a quick show of hands, how many people here are a little bit familiar in some way with Rabbis for Human Rights? How many people have heard me speak before? Okay. So uh, Rabbis for Human Rights is the only rabbinic organization in Israel explicitly dedicated to human rights and in which Orthodox, Reform, Reconstructionist, and Renewal rabbis all coexist in one organization without strangling each other. Um, we were founded in 1988 when our founder, Rabbi David Foreman, wrote an open letter to the chief rabbinate saying, why is it that the religious establishment in this country seems only concerned with Sabbath observance, with kashrut, our Jewish dietary laws? Where are rabbis like Abraham Joshua Heschel running around this country and crying gewalt and speaking to some of the burning moral issues of our society? Um, on principle, we're always involved in at least one issue dealing with the human rights of Jewish Israelis, at least one issue dealing with the human rights of non-Jews who are part of our society or under control. And so our work includes education in, with Israeli young people, sometimes with the army, about Judaism and human rights, economic justice uh, for Israelis, uh, today the issue of African asylum seekers. Uh, I'll be speaking a bit, uh, even more than a bit, about the issue of the Bedouin of the so-called unrecognized villages in the Negev, 
Israeli citizens, and we're most famous or infamous for the work we do on behalf of Palestinian human rights. So uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I, I was on a panel for a premiere of a new uh, film by one of our fellow Israeli human rights organizations, Adala, an Israeli-Palestinian human rights organization. Um, it's a film which some people like, some people find a bit controversial, because it takes two villages, one inside the 67 border, uh, El Rakib, uh, one of these so-called unrecognized um, Bedouin villages, and the other, the village of Susia, a Palestinian village in the South Hebron Hills. And it makes the argument, or, or it compares the stories, and tries to basically say there is a very deep parallel here between these two stories, between uh, the, what's happening with these two villages. Some people um, think that's very accurate. Uh, others, uh, including activists, uh, I'm not, I mean, people on the left as well, say, well, yes, but, but there's so many differences. Uh, these people being Israeli citizens, these not, and, and, and they, they, they are less happy about, uh, about uh, trying to draw this parallel. So um, as a way of uh, trying to think a little bit about uh, democracy and Judaism and what it means uh, to be a Jewish and democratic state and, and what have you, uh, we're going to explore these two the, the stories of Susia and El Akib, and we're going to ask the question, is the parallel uh, a, a good one or not? So a lot of the work that we and rabbis for human rights do is actually in the South Hebron Hills. Uh, there's a unique culture of people that live down there. Um, very likely, some 150 or, or more years ago, uh, they themselves were descended, they, they, Bedouins that came and settled down in the area, although they very much get very upset um, if, if you call them Bedouin. They don't like to be called Bedouin. Um, they, um, uh, there's a, 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 a mother uh, kind of central city of Yatta, and then these, um, these amazing cave communities where uh, some people, because of poverty, some people, because this is their preferred lifestyle, live at least part of the year in caves. Um, we first got involved in the South Hebron Hills back in 1999, when the Israeli army expelled some 700 men, women, and children from these caves. Uh, uh, we were part of a coalition that first provided humanitarian aid. It was the middle of winter, and people were out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and then raised public consciousness, uh, and eventually Israel's high court sent them home. It's a kind of amazing story because uh, the, um, the ex expulsion orders were strange. They said, it doesn't apply if you live there. So on the one hand, we said, that's kind of strange. I mean, so you're going to live in the middle of a live fire? So the reason for the expulsion was allegedly a, a, a live fire zone. Um, coincidentally, 16 live fire zones had been uh, announced that were going to surround areas A and B in, in, in the occupied territories. Um, there is actually one place up north where, where, for many years, live exercises were conducted in the middle of a village with people living there. Uh, but we said, great. Well, they all live there, so there's no problem. Nah, not exactly, because the army said, well, in fact, they all have homes in Yatta, and therefore, they're not really residents of this, these cave communities. Uh, some people live there 12 years around, 12 months uh, of the year, some five, seven. Uh, and then about two weeks before this came to court, uh, the army said, you know, all this proof that we said that they all have these homes in Yatta, uh, well, we really don't. So let's make a deal. OK, so we will now do a study family by family. And whoever has a home in Yatta will have to leave, can come back on weekends to farm or something. But, and if they don't, uh, then they can stay. I mean, 
a ridiculous argument. If, if you have a home in D.C. and another one down in Florida, uh, nobody is going to say, and, you know, take one of your homes. Uh, people have a lifestyle where the, many people do have homes in Yalta, but they're not enough for everybody. They're, they're, you know, it's for the elderly, for the school kids. On the day this was heard in court, uh, the, one of the judges, Justice Derner, asked, well, what's going to happen in the meantime? Oh, they'll stay where they are out in the fields until we can. And she went ballistic and said, you mean you expelled people from their homes on the basis of information you don't have, and now they're going to, no, 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 the, the status quo will be they go back home. Um, a year later, this happened, a, a similar story of an expulsion and the high court sending them back. Uh, having twice not succeeded in expelling these people, uh, their, uh, the Israeli government and, and army started a new policy, which was to make so, life so difficult for these people that they would leave of their own accord. Okay? Um, and uh, literally once, I almost got arrested for bringing people food. A soldier said, well, this is illegal because you're helping people hold on here. Um, and through all the years, we were trying to figure out why is Israel being so stubborn, when not only in the international community, but even inside Israel, um, the government was getting a black eye about this. And, and, but if you look at the maps, you see that this whole area is only a few kilometers from the southern border of, of the occupied territories, so the, the, the 67 border in the south. And we saw eventually on, on Ehud Barak, who was at the time prime minister's maps, that without a few pesky grave dollars, you could, you could claim this, this, this finger of land, this peninsula of land. Remember that every prime minister since uh, Ehud Barak talks about uh, redrawing borders, keeping 80% of the settlers inside uh, uh, Israel. Uh, we don't have a position where borders should be. That's beyond our mandate. But, but, but basically, without these cave dollars, you could, uh, you could uh, have a stronger uh, negotiating position to annex all the South Hebron Hills settlements up to Kiryat Arba, one of the major settlements, of course. Uh, now, one, the, 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 the community that was expelled the second time around is a village called Susia, the village I just mentioned. Susia, the residents of Susia, are people that before 48, they had lands on both sides of the border, of what became the border in 1948. They were pushed into what was Jordan, came under Israeli occupation again in 1967. In 1982, the settlement of Susia was created. And in 1986, an uh, ancient synagogue was discovered in the area where the Palestinian village of Susia was. Uh, I think it is important. Uh, I, I don't agree with the, with the uh, when people say, well, we are colonials, we're just coming from out of nowhere. No, we Jews also have deep roots in this land, and, and, and this synagogue was from thousands of years ago. Where, um, but on the basis of this synagogue, because this synagogue was, was discovered, uh, the, the uh, village was destroyed, the people were expelled, and they had to go out and live in their farmlands. Uh, now, an issue that, uh, because of the fact that, as some people have heard me talk about before, and I think many of you know, that uh, it is almost impossible for a Palestinian to get a legal building permit because of a manipulation of building and zoning laws, which we'll get back to in a bit. Uh, it is, uh, there was no way that, even though this was the land that these people owned, that they could possibly get a building uh, master plan that would allow people to build legally. And they, ever since, they were constantly under threat and danger from time to time, expelled, coming back, what have you. Uh, and a, most recently, they've been dealing with a wonderful outfit called Regavim. Um, Regavim is an organization, and this is a big common denominator between what's going on in 
uh, the Negev and in South Africa Hills, because uh, in both places, under the guise that they are preserving land for the Jewish people, uh, in, the, in the occupied territories, they argue reverse discrimination against settlers uh, to try to get the high court to order the army to demolish more Palestinian homes than they already are. Uh, they almost always lose, but they win when they lose because the arguments, uh, the, the defense of the army is we're okay because we are demolishing homes just at our own pace. And, and there's not, where's the third voice saying, hey guys, why are you demolishing homes at all? Uh, because we are defending Regavim, uh, not defending Regavim, but Susia, uh, that won't happen this time. That third voice will be heard. And, and by the way, the, the, some of the um, background, uh, 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 a uh, year or so before this uh, Regavim petition was submitted, uh, one of the settlers from Susia came to me and, and over a cup of coffee uh, begged us to stop our high court petitions because in that area we've returned serious amounts of land to Palestinians that have been taken over by the settlers of the area and, and he was begging us to stop doing that. So this was their way of perhaps counterattacking. Um, So that's Susia. El Arakib. El Arakib is a so-called unrecognized village inside Israel. They're Israeli citizens. Well, what is an unrecognized village? All right, these are, for the most part, villages, Bedouin villages that existed before the state of Israel. Or remember that until 1966, there was an Israeli, uh, there was a military government ruling over Israeli Arabs. And there are villages uh, already back in the 1950s, the policy was to move Bedouin out of the western Negev, move them eastward. And so some of these people are in areas where the army moved them. In the case of El Aqib, uh, they and this is not necessarily representative of all of the Bedouin, by any means. Uh, they actually uh, have Turkish, British, and even Israeli ownership documents, uh, starting from the purchase, Turkish purchase documents when the uh, Turi tribe uh, purchased this land from the Al-Nukbi tribe back in 1908. The oldest gravestones in their cemetery go back to 1913. Uh, many Bedouin, uh, don't have these so-called Western documents. Uh, there was a Bedouin system of determining land ownership. Uh, the Ottomans, the British recognized it. Uh, there are early Zionist uh, pioneers, such as David Zalman, who actually came, and you read their descriptions, and, and, they, and they come down and they describe how the Negev was populated by Bedouin, said, who owned land there, um, who actually wanted to coexist with Jews, who, uh, to even in cases, sell land. Uh, there are kibbutzim, such as kibbutz lahavim, that, that is, a lot of its land is on land that was actually sold to them by the, by the, by the residents of El Rakib. Their, their proofs of ownership were good enough to buy the land, uh, but things get more complicated afterwards. So in 1953, the um, army says, you've got to move for six months and then we'll let you come back. Well, uh, as in so many other cases, they weren't allowed to come back. Um, now, uh, some of them came back in any case. Uh, many of them ended up in Rahat. The policy was to try to move the Bedouin out of their villages, and, and, and Israel created seven artificial townships, uh, which uh, some are better, some are worse. Rahat is actually one of the worst. Uh, but in, but the big picture is that they are magnets for crime, for drugs, for poverty, for unemployment, for despair. Uh, in a, in some, we just were checking Israeli government statistics. Um, if you compare the townships to the recognized villages, the unrecognized villages, there aren't any statistics because they don't exist. Um, uh, four times greater amounts of poverty and unemployment. Uh, 
So uh, the, 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 uh, the AO was to move people into these townships. Uh, unrecognized villages, no services, no water, no electricity. As there is no water or electricity hookups for Susia. Um, as in, in the 1970s, the government invited the Bedouin to submit their land claims. I think they probably thought this was a trap. It was a trap, probably. Bedouin, what do they know about land ownership? They're nomads. It'll be so jumbled, so confused, that it would be able to have the perfect excuse to throw it all out. Well, they submitted some 3,200 land claims, and they fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. So that, so the, the, the claims came to about a million 250,000 dunum, four dunum to an acre. 500,000, the uh, dunum, the government just said off the top, we're not going to deal with that. It was grazing land. You can't claim that, that you own it. In the ensuing years, some 200,000 dunum have been um, generally through forced arbitration or sometimes in court, uh, some kinds of settlements. Uh, usually not very, um, not, not to the benefit of, of the Bedouin, uh, maybe getting some kind of compensation or alternative land. And there are about 650,000 dunum remaining. Um, and for gold-plated matzabal, if you talk to Israelis, we just uh, uh, conducted a, a study, you know, the vast majority of Israelis believe even if they are sympathetic to Palestinian issues, when it comes to the Bedouin, they're criminal, they're violent, they're taking over the Negev. So for a gold-plated matzabal, if all those land claims were recognized, what percentage of the Negev are we talking about? Any guesses? 5.4%. 5.4%. Uh, for about 30% of the population. So, um, El Rakib, the Jewish National Fund, uh, started foresting over the land. The forests were encroaching, encroaching, encroaching. They decided to come, and people that already gone to Rod to come back and try to build a community, uh, build a, a, a beautiful village, uh, until it was demolished in 2010. Um, in the meantime, um, there were a series of commissions to figure out what to do with the Bedouin. In 2007, the Goldberg Commission. Uh, many of us in the activist community were debating whether to cooperate or not. And we were so pleasantly surprised. It wasn't exactly the recommendation that we would have come up with. But first of all, uh, former High Court Judge Goldberg did something very radical. He actually spoke to the Bedouin. Um, and, 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 and he didn't recommend preserving all of the 35. There's, today, there's about 35 unrecognized villages. 11 have already been recognized. Um, but he said that the solution had to be based on the existing villages. Well, the government didn't like that. So what do you do when you don't like the results of your own commission? You create a commission on the commission. All right. So the Prover Commission was created. And the Prover Commission came up with very different recommendations, which would lead to the expulsion of some 30 or 40,000 additional Bedouin, uh, moving them into these, um, these townships, demolishing tens of villages, uh, dispossessing the Bedouin of most of their land. Uh, one of the things that kept that from being implemented was that the right wing doesn't think that goes far enough. People like in Regavim say this is soft on the Bedouin. So, Former uh, in, uh, government minister without portfolio from the previous government, uh, Benny Begin, did another round of talks. Uh, and he came up uh, just uh, this, a few months ago with a report which was kind of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, or what we say in the Jewish tradition, the uh, voice of Jacob but the hands of Esau. All right? uh, it had all the um, warm, 
understanding language of Goldberg about the poverty, about needing to lift Bedouin out of poverty, of training, of education, services, infrastructure. Uh, but the bottom line recommendations were the recommendations of proper. And in, on May 6, the government decided to send legislation based on Begin Prover to the Knesset. I have to say to you that, and I've been working for Rabbis Human Rights for 18 years. I've dealt with countless and a huge variety of human rights violations against Palestinians, against our fellow Israelis, you name it. This, to me, is the greatest moral tragedy, potentially, the moral disaster for the state of Israel that I have dealt with in 18 years. Because if this legislation goes through, 40,000 people, and, and, and uh, there have been numbers like that, I suppose, but not on my watch. And, and, and many of the violations we deal with are some extenuating circumstances, or it's done in the shadows, not everybody knows, or it becomes sense. By Knesset decree, in the light of day, we will be demolishing tens of villages of Israeli citizens, expelling some 40,000 people from their homes, and dispelling, uh, dispossessing them of the, the majority of their lands. Um, some of you may have seen the little video clip that we produced with Theodore Bikel, one of the best known tevya the, the, is from Fiddler on the Roof of all time, saying how painful it is for him that the descendants of those expelled from the real Anatevkas in Russia in the 19th century are now about to do the same to Bedouin, are, are recreating. Uh, I have back here the bill, you can see on the back page, a map. There will be a new pale of settlement where Bedouin are allowed to live and where they are not. The village of El Akib has no chance. It's outside the pale. It's outside the area where Bedouin are going to be allowed to live. So, those are the two stories, and in a few minutes we will talk a little bit about are they related stories, how are they related. Let me say a few words about democracy. When you ask your average Israeli, talking about, it, and and. Um, Often, the first thing you hear from human rights organizations, from peace organizations, uh, we shout and we, we get upset and we say, this isn't democratic. And the answer that comes back is, well, of course it's democratic. The Knesset, which has you know, with a majority in the Knesset, which was democratically elected, democratically decided to implement this policy or that policy or the other policy. Um, and, and, and that is, um, I have less to say about what it means to be a Jewish and a democratic state. Um, I have more to say about a democratic state living according to Jewish values. Uh, um, As I think anybody who's a student of democracy knows, that the idea that uh, the majority can do whatever it wants is perhaps one definition, but it's a very unsophisticated, of course, definition of democracy, where, uh, of course, I would say, and I think most of us would say, that democracy isn't just about what the majority can do, it's about what the majority cannot do. That Democracy also has to have a definition of what uh, the, the majority cannot do. So now let me give the Jewish part of it.
Rabbi Shimshon Raphael Hirsch, late 19th century rabbi, credited as being one of the founders of modern orthodoxy. And some of you may recall that in the Torah, in the Bible, uh, there is a command uh, that when we're reaping our grain, uh, and this is one of the ways, by the way, that the Bible comes alive if you uh, come to Israel-Palestine, because just as the Bible describes that around Passover, we start the barley harvest, and then by the time we get to Shavuot, we're talking about wheat harvest, you see it happening. Um, you also see the Bible come alive in the South Urban Hills, uh, the fights over wells and water, and, 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 it, and like nothing's changed in 4,000 years. But, but her says, the, the, the Bible, the Torah says, when you're reaping your fields, you are supposed to leave the corners and any fallen sheaves for the poor to glean. And Rabbi Hirsch asks the following question. He says, why is it that the Torah has to get into this? Wouldn't it be enough to say that people with property need to be nice and decent to those who don't have it, don't have property? And his answer is the following. He says, when those with property and power appropriate for themselves the white man's burden of how to be just and decent to those who are not sitting at the table, those who have no power, have no voice. He says, govel impesha. It borders on criminality. It's almost always going to end badly. Now, obviously, there is some difference between, here there is a difference. The Bedouin and the Negev are Israeli citizens. They vote. They, there have been Bedouin members of Knesset. They, 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 they can try to impact on the political process inside Israel in the democratic system. Very limited because they're a small minority. Certainly now, if we talk about the Palestinians, how many Palestinians are in the Knesset that decides the laws that decide their fate. Again, there are Israeli Palestinians, but in terms of Palestine from the occupied territories, zero. How many Palestinian judges on the courts that decide their cases? Zero. There is, there's an Israel, again, Israeli Arab member of uh, a high court. But I, 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 so again, we have to distinguish between inside Israel and the occupied territories. Um, okay. Uh, how many Palestinians are on the planning and zoning committees that decide, that create the master plans for Palestinian communities in the occupied territories? Zero. Some of you may have heard in this last year something called the Edmund Levy Commission. Uh, the Israeli government had a real conundrum. The government, the, the courts had ruled in several high-profile cases that they had to uh, 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 evacuate, dismantle buildings and settlements because the settlements were built on what the government itself recognized to be privately owned Palestinian land. The government statistics acknowledge some 21% of uh, the uh, settlements are being built on private Palestinian land. The actual numbers are much, much higher. But that's what the government recognizes. The settlement movement obviously was pressuring not to give in. Eventually, the government had to go along with the courts. They didn't like it, and so they set up a commission with a former high court justice, Edmund Levy, to make the treif kosher. Okay. Uh, to find a legal uh, a justification why it's okay to build on private housing land that's not yours. And they came up with the goods. They came up with a learned treatise of why this should be legal. How many Palestinians were on the Edmund Levy Commission? Zero. When those with power write the rules, and Hirsch says this as well, 
said, you cannot allow those who have all the power in their hands to write the rules. It borders on criminality. It's always going to end badly. Um, two more comments, and then we'll move to the next part of this program. What is our role? What does our role need to be? Ibn Ezra is a medieval Torah commentator, and he comments on uh, frequently on uh, what is the most repeated in different versions of one another command in the entire Torah? Right. Okay. Right. The gear. Um, and, and, and there's, there's, there, 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 there is a problem, of course, referring to Palestinians, either Israeli Palestinians or in the occupied territories as gerim, as strangers. Um, but actually, the better way of translating it is the non-Jew who lives among you, who kind of lives among you, accepts the ground rules, and, and is told you have to treat them as you would any other citizen. It appears 36 times. I think God had already figured out that this was going to be the most difficult command to obey. And that's why it had to be repeated so many times. And Ibn Ezra says, that these commands are particularly uh, directed toward the judge. Because he says, when the gear or the, or the widow or the stranger, those without power in society, if, if, if people in the dominant groups in society are wronged, they know how to shout, they know how to cry, they know how to hire the high-powered lawyers. But if you're part of these voiceless groups in society, you can shout all you want and no one's going to hear. And he says, there's, interesting, there's two different versions in the Hebrew. Some it says they have no oz, strength, and some they have no ozer, no one to stand by their side to help them. Um, one day in Susia, we brought down a group of um, diplomats, and Nasser Nawaja, one of the spokespeople down there, said something that just blew me away. He said, when they came to demolish our homes in 1986, There was nothing we could do. We were all alone. We're in huge, great danger again today, but there's one big difference. We're not alone anymore. It's not enough. It's not enough to fight the good fight. You've got to win it. But I also think that it's important to look at the, the connection between Oz and Ozeo. Um, I think this has something to do about what democracy is really supposed to be about as well. One of our greatest challenges, perhaps, in the human rights community, as Israelis, is it so easy for us to see ourselves as the knights in shining armor coming to help the poor natives. But if you're really the ozer, the person helping, you, if you do, you have to make sure that you aren't part of the process that's also taking away the oz, the, the, the power of those you're trying to work with. You need to be empowering and not seeping away power working as partners. And the last comment I want to make, and, and I, I, I promised that I would say something about Erie, Pennsylvania, where I grew up. Believe it or not, and not too many people know this, but when I um, I actually, in high school, played high school football. Yeah. Now, to say that I played high school football is a bit of an exaggeration. Uh, in four years, I don't think I was in the game for four plays. <laughs> now, in our varsity team had this record-breaking winning streak. We had this amazing coach. He was a schreier. He was febrent. He would shout. He would exhort. He would literally foam at the mouth. But he would always say, I only shout at the people I can make into better football players. In three years, he never shouted at me once, OK? <laughs> All right? There was no point. There was nothing that this wonderful coach could have possibly have done 
to make me into a good football player. And the reason that I bring this up is because when we, in Rabbis Human Rights and other organizations that are in the peace or human rights community, when we shout, when we go to court, when we use the tools of Israeli democracy, remember that there's parts of this world where if I was doing what I would, if I came and gave this talk, I'd go home and it would be a death sentence. But when we shout, when we use the courts, when we stand in front of bulldozers sometimes and do acts of civil disobedience, if I didn't believe in the basic goodness of my fellow Israelis, if I didn't believe in the very basic Jewish teaching, which is that people can change and get, come closer to their highest selves. Even our, our term in Judaism for sin is het. It's an archery term. We were trying to do our best. We were trying to hit the mark, and we just missed it a bit. But maybe next time we'll do better. If I didn't believe those things, there would be no point. I'd be wasting my breath. I'd be wasting my time. So why do I maintain that faith when I see these things going on around us? Well, you know, that uh, in a poll that we had commissioned recently, uh, about two years ago, we saw about 77% of Israelis believe in human rights. About 49, if you ask them specifically about Palestinian human rights. Most of them, however, believe that anything that we talk about is an isolated, non-representative, non-systematic, irrelevant, incident and they believe that our institutions are doing their best to combat these things. And therefore, we're between a rock and a hard place. If we go with this and we don't challenge it, then they say, well, why are you making such a big deal and giving such a terrible name in the international community? These things are so irrelevant. But if we challenge them and say, these, no, these things are systematic, sadly, they're much more ingrained then we are, we are um, bursting people's most dearly held, one of people's most dearly held bubbles, the illusion that they've been able to create for themselves. You know that most Israelis truly believe that we have the most moral army in the world. Now, I don't think we have, by any means, the most immoral army, let me be clear. Um, but they believe these things. But here's also as infuriating, as challenging as that is, what that also means is that Israelis want to have the most moral army in the world. They want to believe that we are observing and honoring human rights. And what that means is that in some way, our goal, and that's, for example, why we're trying to get people like yourselves, and I'm gonna, if there's one thing everybody can do here, take our literature, get the um, get the, the, the link to the petitions you can send to Israeli ministers about this Bedouin issue, for example. Because we have to hold up a big mirror. One of our, our rabbi, Larry Kushner, tells a story that he brings the nursery school kids in his synagogue to see the sanctuary. But he says, you've got to come back, he tells the kids, on another day before I'm going to show you what's inside the ark. And this, the teacher reported afterwards, sparked this debate among the kids. What's in that ark? And the best answer, Rabbi Kushner says, is one kid who said, inside that ark is a big mirror. Molly Cohen, in a story, writes about a princess, a spoiled princess, and she gets everything she wants in the world, but now she's got a, a tough request that no one in the kingdom in the castle can help her with. She wants to see God. Finally, her parents send her out into the real world. And seeing all that's out there, she comes back in tears. Her parents hold up a mirror and say, now you've seen God. So when I think about the challenges that we have to be a democracy when we have such a facile today understanding of what democracy is all about. 
as I, we confront the basic essence of challenged democracy and of human rights when those with power are making decisions for people who aren't sitting at the table. Um, and when I think about what it would be, would it mean to have a country that's not necessarily a Jewish state in terms of Jewish hegemony necessarily, but one that's living up to some of our highest Jewish values, I think it starts with holding up a mirror because God can't do it alone. God needs our help. Even our word in, for prayer is a reflexive verb to judge ourselves, judging ourselves by that mirror that we call God. Thank you. Can I let Rabbi sit here with the question answer? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we'll, we have plenty of time for some questions and answers. Please identify yourself. Uh, I'd like to, if I may, ask the first question. The United States went through uh, many generations of conflict mm -hmm. uh, over lots of issues, but the central issue was the issue of uh, equality and respect uh, for others. Uh, it, it did not come spontaneously with the creation of our country. Uh, it took a long time. Uh, it took a terrible civil war. Uh, it took uh, constant uh, evolutions of the American Constitution. And we are still not there yet. But uh, is the national question in Israel and Palestine uh, two competing nationalisms of, of people who, who demand their own national entities? Uh, it c can this one be resolved before this more difficult question of recognizing uh, the human rights uh, respect for the other uh, protection of minorities, which, as you say, should be the essence of democracy, just not ma majority rule. Is it going to take that long in Israel, or can this process be uh, collapsed? Um, and in the end, will nationalism prevail, uh, or will it be a new kind of uh, uh, entity of Israel and Palestine, uh, uh, which is one country. Right. Um, so that's an excellent question. As always, you always have excellent questions. Um, and I don't fully have the answer. Of course, we're already in a different kind of position because uh, we don't have a constitution. Um, but uh, what I will say is the following. I, I Unfortunately, right now, I think as a society, we're moving backwards. In other words, I think at one point, uh, as an Israeli society, we had a much, m m we did have much more of a concept of democracy, including some kind of protection for minorities. I think we're losing that, uh, not gaining that. Um, we got to start going in the other direction. And, and here's, here's the dilemma. Uh, and here is, and, and, I, and I probably said this here before, but, but one of our real dilemmas is that everybody in this room, myself included, feels that there is no time to waste, to dilly-dally. Um, every minute that goes by, every day that goes by where we don't have peace, where we don't have uh, honoring human rights, where we where we, um, where, we, uh, where we don't have a, a, a more sophisticated idea of, of how we, those with power, treat those who, the minorities. Um, it's a tragedy. It's a crime, perhaps. And so um, we are always living with the hope and acting of what we have to change today and tomorrow, or yesterday. I often feel like within our organization, I'm the fireman. I'm the person who's dealing with the burning world issue right now, like this Bedouin issue, which has got me consumed at the moment. Um, but the reason that we have also an education department 
is because even though we have to believe, you know, um, with emunash lema, that, that we're going to solve everything tomorrow, too often we haven't given sufficient thought to what happens if we don't. And whereas the Arik Ashramans get the ego strokes because I can go around the, the world and people know who I am and, and this kind of stuff, on the so-called other side, there are people who, are, um, who will never know their names, but they, for the last 40 years, have been doing what we haven't done sufficiently. They've been investing in grassroots education and raising up a generation of people that don't understand what democracy is about, for starters. Um, and, that's what, and we've got a lot of makeup to do, even as we continue to work to change things in the here and now. We've got to be investing more about what are we doing if we don't change things in the here and now, and it's going to take some more time. Um, I don't really um, care that much whether it's going to be a one or a two or a ten state solution. Not only do I represent our organization, which doesn't have a position on that, but I think it's a process. I, I, think, I don't think the two state solution is dead. I don't think it's essential. I think it's, um, um, but, but one of the reasons, why, one of the reasons that, 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 there, uh, that one hears an objection among some Palestinians is precisely that were we to have a one-state solution tomorrow, um, even if it was one person, one vote, uh, there would still be Jewish hegemony and, and, and that, in fact, there's a need for Palestinians to have the experience of having statehood independently before we can talk about a one-state solution. Again, I, I'm willing to let the politicians work that one out. Yes. Yeah. Now. <laughs> Do you want to take over, Phil? Uh, yeah, uh, actually, um, I want to ask a question, okay. just following up on uh, uh, what you, you just said. Um, because you talk about the process of dispossession that's happening, mm -hmm. ongoing right now, inside Israel with respect to the Bedouin, um, with, and then inside the occupied territories in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't talk about the dispossession that coincided with the founding of mm -hmm. the, the uh, of Israel, and I and I wonder why you skip over that that piece, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I think you know as someone that has uh, lived in the occupied territories for a very long time and uh, several years and come in contact with many Israelis. I think it's a very important question for, for the Israeli um, na nation, for the Jewish nation to, to resolve. And so I, I, I wonder you know, why you, you pull on these elements of human rights, of justice, of equality, talk about the process of dispossession, but f then perhaps feel that it's not necessary, not necessary to start from the beginning of the story in order to understand the processes that are currently ongoing? Well, I think I started almost at the beginning of the story when I talked about already what was happening to the Bedouin back in the 1950s. It's true, I didn't start with the Nakba of 48 or something like this. But that was uh, the Bedouin, right, as right, if they're right. a separate population from right. the, the, pal the rest of the Palestinians. Uh, um, OK, I, I guess I would say in my defense, it was giving an example from which one could gather the rest of the story. But uh, I, I wouldn't dispute what you're saying. Um, I think. How does it fit in your narrative? In my narrative, yes. personally, well, and your worldview. Mm -hmm. So this is what I would say. We Jews prayed to this day, but certainly for all two thousand years, for our right of return. Okay, from the time that we were expelled from our homeland. It's in our prayers three times a day. It's integrated into all of our holidays. Um, for hundreds of years, many Jews held on to the keys of the homes they were forced to abandon in Spain. So obviously, it would be very hypocritical for me, uh, who wants my right of return, to ignore the Nakba, to ignore those who are talking about 
not only the occupation of 67, but from 48, and this kind of thing. I, 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 don't, I can't ignore that. I have a... Um, Second side of that, though, because I often feel that um, many who primarily identify with the Palestinian cause um, talking about the Palestinian right of return uh, don't get the Jewish right of return. And I think that we need a principle that nobody asks for themselves what they're not pre prepared to grant to others. Um, now this causes another challenge, mm -hmm. because um, full, uh, well, and some of people have heard me say this before, I personally would be happy to live in a world without borders. No more United States, Mexico, or Canada. No more Norway, Denmark, Sweden. As long as we're living in a world of nation states. I believe that we as the Jewish people have not a greater but an equal right to a nation state as to the Palestinians or to anybody else. And now the conflict. Because there cannot be full Palestinian right of return uh, and a Jewish nation state because um, uh, you know, full, you know, uh, um, because they're in conflict. And that's why at some point we move, have to move beyond full actualization of everything that are our rights to how we find compromise and we live together. Again, I, I, I think that it's something we have to work out. I don't think that there's one right solution. I do think that it starts with acknowledging that there's a real issue here, that there's a real question here. And so I... Um, um, agree with you that we also have to confront 48 and not just what happened afterwards. Okay. I want, uh, Jim Colby is physician. Can you wait for the mic, please? Can you wait for the microphone, please? Thank you. Jim Colby is physician of human rights. Einstein, a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. back around 1948, said, nationalism is a cancer in our society. Just a comment. Okay. Is that a... Um, sometimes I think that John Lennon had it right. We'd be better without nationalism and without religion. Um, um, but they are part of a reality, and for me as a religious person, it, faith isn't something you just turn on and off like a light bulb. And so, um, again, I'd be happy to live in a world without borders. Um, the question is, how uh, do we make the best of the here and now without giving up on what we maybe would like to see sometime in the future. Yes, hi Eric, good to see you again, Jim Vitarello. Uh, could you comment on Bibi's uh, insistence that uh, the Palestinians recognize uh, Israel as a quote unquote Jewish state, which according to my recollection, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, no other prime minister has ever insisted on that, as particularly as a precondition to negotiations. And sort of, what do you think his motives are? Um, do you do you sort of agree with this assertion or not? And if not, why? I'd be thrilled if the Palestinians would recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Uh, I think it's absolutely ridiculous to make that a condition for negotiations. Um, and and especially when, from the other side of his mouth, uh, our prime minister says there should be no conditions for negotiation. Um, this brings up a very other interesting thing. Uh, it's not exactly what you asked, but, but it's a good chance to talk about something. Um, there's another very interesting thing that's starting to happen right now in Israel. Um, Regavim is one of the first examples of uh, right-wing organizations that are in some ways trying to copy what we uh, human rights organizations do, using courts and what have you, 
using our discourse. There's now something called, you know, of course we have the Association for Civil Rights in Israel, and now there's the Association for Civil Rights in Judea and Samaria. Um, uh, there is uh, one of the, there's uh, uh, Yoaz Handel, Handel has talked about creating parallel organizations to each of our organizations, having a, um, a kind of right-wing physicians for human rights, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, their thesis is uh, that the existing human rights organizations get the democratic and miss the Jewish. Uh, one of their corner, uh, their, their, their things that they're pushing more than anything else is that parallel as a counterweight or a balance to our, uh, one of our basic laws, we don't have a constitution, but we do have basic laws, which are laws which require an extraordinary majority to change and this kind of thing. Um, and, one, and one of the centerpieces is um, uh, the, the, the uh, law about the dignity and freedom of, of humanity, of human beings, uh, which is, which is uh, um, kind of based on our Declaration of Independence, but it, but it, but it's, it is a legal basis for uh, the honoring of human rights and, and these kinds of things. And they want to have a hook al um, um one that uh, also grounds in law the um, Israel uh, as a Jewish, the state of the Jewish, the country of the Jewish nation, or this kind of thing. Um, that is going to be uh, causing us a lot of challenges, if, uh, because I think they're going to try to continue to push this. The other thing that we're going to try to do, frankly, is see if they can put their money where their mouth is. Uh, they, supposedly they say we also recognize the legitimacy of all the issues that we have been talking about over the years. Um, now let's see what they're really going to do as they, they create some of these organizations. But, but, but one of our challenges is going to be um, um, uh, as the right wing is going to try to continue to say that somehow uh, what they have and we don't have is any sense of Jewish national identity or something like this. We have one hand. I want to thank you for being here, and I want to thank you for everything you stand for. Um, I'm Lebanese, I'm an artist, I'm an art professor, and I lived in Lebanon for 20 years before immigrating to the United States, and uh, I grew up as Catholic, and as everybody I think here will know that that area of the world is gonna burn because of religion. Even, um, you know, the voices that we're hearing now about Sunni clerics who are claiming holy war against the Shia. And, um, Do you have a question? It, I'm, I, I'm getting there. Please. I, I, I'll try to make it very quick. People like you make me believe in humanity again. My question to you is, when you see the big picture, which you try to talk about, and your uh, parallel between the United States and the history and what's happening in Israel, as a Lebanese American, my question to you is, are you frustrated or do you celebrate the unconditional support of the United States to Israel? Uh -huh, okay. um, it's, uh, I'm obviously frustrated. Um, I don't want the United States to abandon Israel. But I think the real question is, what does it mean to support Israel? What is really support for Israel? And I think that what we've seen increasingly um, in the United States in recent years, um, I mean, until very recently, the dominant paradigm, certainly in the Jewish community, and this was what we, the message we projected and, what, and, and the message that we asked the American government to adopt was 
Israel right or wrong? And that uh, what we have to do, particularly in the Jewish community, is support the elected government of the state of Israel, whether or not we agree, we don't live there. Now, again, there is some truth. My kids have risks that, that, that people here don't share. Right? There's some truth to that. But I think there's another paradigm, which I would paraphrase as, and I think that's becoming increasingly legitimate and accepted as a alternative paradigm, which I would characterize as friends don't let friends drive drunk. <laughs> okay? Um, and and, and, and what, I, what I'm trying to say is, uh, we all know whether we're talking about interpersonal relations or between countries, that the person or the country that says, yes, dear, anything you want, dear, is not, at the end of the day, the person that's really showing real support. Um, and uh, uh, I, at least, think that in the long run, that could be um, detrimental to Israel. As someone who is an Israeli, a Jew, a rabbi, a Zionist, a patriot, um, again, I think that sometimes true support is holding up that mirror. So can I ask you a follow-up question, yeah. Rabbi? Um, we had two Israeli journalists here last week, and they were talking about the impact that the separation between Palestinians and Israeli Jews is having on the consciousness of the Israeli Jewish public is saying we don't have to deal with the conflict. And they said that Obama's visit um, was powerful in the sense that it raised issues that people had preferred to just um, push aside or, 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 or um, neglect. And I'm wondering if you can comment on his visit and, and any impact that you saw and uh, the sort of the, the, the style and approach of talking directly mm -hmm. to the Israeli public and whether that brought out any follow-up debate. I, I was at that talk and, and, and it was a very powerful talk. The whole visit was very powerful. L let me backtrack and say a few words about the Obama administration. I know that I may be getting into some hot water here, but um, you are in Washington, right? <laughs> when, when um, immediately after uh, President Obama was elected for his first term, he had, in many ways, Netanyahu um, and on the ropes. I, I remember our, our mayor of Jerusalem, Barakat coming back visibly shaken by what he experienced um, in Washington, and also what he was hearing, frankly, from some of the American Jewish community. Um, in August 2009, I guess that the Israeli government um, sensed a little bit of blood in the water as uh, Obama's polls went down a bit. That was, of course, when uh, the Rawi and Hanun families were evicted from their homes in Sheikh Jarrah. Um, I think that the Israeli government decided to start pushing back. And at that critical moment, um, the administration didn't know how to respond. And, and, and um, what Obama tried to do with his visit was to try to put things on a new track. And part of that strategy, as you correctly pointed out, was to try to, uh, on the one hand, really he came in and made nice with Netanyahu. And on the other hand, try to go around uh, the government and speak directly to the Israeli people. I think that was a good start. But like with everything else in life, uh, a good start is a good start. How do you follow up? Um, and. Um, I can't say that I've seen a great deal of follow-up. Um, I do think, and, and again, people that have heard me have heard me say this a million times, uh, there is no lack of peace plans. What we really need is a binational psychologist, okay? 
I mean, I mean, when you look at the fact that opinion polls show a sane majority consistently of Israelis and Palestinians who want a compromise negotiated agreement, but even a larger percentage of both sides that say, we want peace, they don't. Um, it's not that there aren't peace plans. It's not that there isn't a majority of people on both sides who would like us to achieve peace. Sometimes, I think, particularly on the Israeli side, um, there's a lack of understanding what that might require of us. But, but, the, but the will is there. The thing that is most missing is belief that it's possible. And, and again, I brought this up before, um, whatever we may think about the Egyptian peace treaty, the fact is that a week before Sadat came to Jerusalem, a Poles in Israel consistently, there was opposition solidly to what a week later Israelis overwhelmingly uh, endorsed. When it became real, and you put aside the sour grapes, but we didn't really want it and because we didn't think it was possible, possible, then things changed. I really believe that if tomorrow uh, the representatives, you know, representatives of the Arab League would say, you've been ignoring our peace proposal for 10 years. Enough is enough. We are coming to Jerusalem next week to solve this. All right, you know, we're, this, this is it. We're, we're, um, I think that you would find the same kind of melding and overnight change of Israeli public opinion. Uh, in a sense, that's kind of what uh, Barack was trying to do, was go to the people, uh, get around the, 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 the gatekeepers as to <laughs> use a, um, uh, of, 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 of public opinion. Uh, but a lot more has to be done. And, 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 and I think it does require kind of these bold moves uh, that doesn't give um, the gatekeepers on the, either the Israeli or the Palestinian sides the chance to do what they've done so often in the past. Thank you. We have a question here. Um, I really like, uh, I'm Karen Getman. Uh, I like what you say about reflective point of view and, and looking in the mirror. And I think that's really an important point. I heard uh, last week or so in Al Jazeera some um, new Jewish historians and British historians talking about the Nakba and the uh, point of view of uh, Britain really taking some responsibility for what happened and for Israel also taking responsibility for truth-telling in what really happened uh, during the Nakba. And I, I wonder if everybody can step away from saving face and begin to talk about the mistakes and the self-interest that was involved and how this came out so badly um, could that also help in forging uh, a real conversation of peace? I've always been two of two minds about that. Um, there's a great need by both Israelis and Palestinians to hear from the other side, we did wrong, we made mistakes, we did whatever. Um, whether it be um, the, 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 the massacre in Deir Yassin, or you know, my wife's grandfather was witness to the massacre of Jews in 1921 uh, in uh, um, one of the massacres uh, uh, the, uh, in Tel Chai. Um, I think that does meet a great need that people have. I think when we can admit that to ourselves, um, we might start hearing the other side, again, quote unquote, in a different way, interpreting things in a different way when we understand and we acknowledge ourselves what they've experienced and what brings them to the point that they're at. And the other side of me says, um, there's a great danger 
because, because there's an endless pit of history that we can s debate forever and ever and ever um, and spend so much time arguing about that uh, that, that we don't just start moving forward, which we have to do sometimes. So I, I really am a, totally honestly two minds about that, and I go back and forth. Um, like everything else, there needs to be a balance, the right balance of, 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 of opening that, but not getting so sucked into that that um, we um, become incapable of moving forward. We have here a question. Oh, hi. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I, my name is Larry Ottinger, and I'm a member of a Reform Temple in Washington, D.C., Temple Sinai. Uh, I have two questions. One is I'd be interested to hear any reflections on the Reform movement or efforts in Israel. The second is relates to democracy and what seemed to me to be almost a little bit too dismissive, well, what the majority wants, hey, you know, we've got uh, here, we do have a Bill of Rights and our democracy is based on that Constitution and you do use the basic law. But I wonder about whether you are or not engaging in the political process. And I don't necessarily mean just your group, but you know, sort of uh, human rights or social justice groups generally to uh, be engaged because that's, uh, that's where a lot happens, and obviously women couldn't vote in this country, blacks didn't have the right to vote, and there were, we had civil rights movements, and even in this last election, the fact that so many Latino Americans voted is making a difference now in terms of our ability to potentially pursue uh, comprehensive immigration reform. So I just wonder if you don't see it as your role to be involved in politics or political efforts or, uh, or how that works out. So in terms of the reform movement, um, although I am personally a reform rabbi, uh, we as an organ and I've actually spoken at uh, Sinai before, um, we don't, as an organization, get into issues of religion and state uh, and some of these issues which are concerned to the reform movement because that's what allows us as to be an organization including orthodox reform, conservative reconstructionists, and renewal rabbis. I, I'm very... If some of you haven't seen it, um, one th in the last just a couple of days um, in Great Britain, uh, we had about 65 rabbis spanning the movements that met with the Israeli ambassador, delivered a letter to Netanyahu about the Bedouin issue. Uh, in here, the uh, the, the, re the renewal movement, I think the Reconstructionists, and just yesterday the Reform movement issued a statement about the Bedouin issue. Uh, the, the, the statement was a little bit weaker than I would have liked to have seen, but nevertheless, uh, a clear call to Netanyahu saying, hold your horses on, this, uh, uh, on what you're about to do with the Bedouin and this kind of thing. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm, of course, proud of that. Uh, in terms of the question about politics, I often say, uh, we are a non-political organization. Uh, we are not a political organization, but we are a very political because we operate in a political world. So uh, in terms, particularly of internal economic uh, justice issues inside Israel, we're constantly engaged in lobbying. Uh, we, we're writing proposed legislation to try to preserve public housing in Israel, for example. Uh, when it comes... I was day and night lobbying on the Bedouin issue, speaking member of Knesset to, 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 to the, the, the aides, to, to the government ministers, and, and our staff and the culture of other organizations that we're working with are continuing to do that. Um, and so we absolutely do that. Um, do you see traction? And uh, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. But I, but I want to say is that on the Palestinian issues in particular, uh, we basically see almost no hope of accomplishing anything in the Knesset because of just the clear majority for the right wing. Uh, we spend more effort in the legal system. Uh, now there's also, by the way, a debate among human rights lawyers. There are Israeli human rights lawyers that think we should be boycotting the high court because it's a fig leaf, they, they would argue. Um, I could cite a long string of things that we've done 
through the court system. For example, as a result of the high court orders returning Palestinians to their home in, in, in the South Urban Hills, uh, our 2006 decision, uh, as a result of which Palestinian olive farmers are getting the lands they couldn't get to for two, five, 10, even 15 years. Instead of our volunteers getting their heads cracked open as human shields, we now have the, by court order, the Israeli army protecting Palestinians to get to their olive trees. Okay, so, uh, and, and I can tell you all the things that they've been so disappointing and failed to uphold what I would say the principles of international law and what have you. They've never taken a strong stand on home demolitions. We actually have coming up uh, on October 3rd, if the, if the court doesn't postpone it again, uh, what could be the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest high court case in the making, where uh, we started back in 2004. Our original idea was to ask the Israeli army or demand that they do a fair and better job of planning for Palestinian communities. Uh, for all the reasons that I already have cited, uh, from Rabbi Hirsch and what have you, uh, we decided that it was kind of like rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, and that therefore our ask has become that planning in Palestinian communities be returned to Palestinian hands in, in Area C. Um, but uh, so, so we do use the courts where we do think there is possibility of traction, we, 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 um, we do use uh, or we try to influence the government and the Knesset. Um, we don't think we have much chance of traction on the Palestinian issues. We sometimes get traction on the internal Israeli economic justice issues. And we haven't given up on the Bedouin issues, but it remains to be seen. Um, I can tell you that since the um, high, since the government decided to send this legislation to the Knesset, uh, there's been a series of postponements when uh, the first reading, the first vote was supposed to come up. Um, I'd love to say it's because of us. I'm a little bit hesitant to say that. I, uh, the sensible reason has been uh, that uh, there's been so many other things on the docket. Um, we thought that the right wing, uh, which originally was opposing this, was now going to let it go through the first reading so that they could wreak havoc and make it all the worse in committee. But now they may be that they're opposing it. But we also, it's not impossible that that mirror that we've been holding up um, with uh, rabbis, working through the international community has started to have some effect on the political system. Um, it's still ahead of us to see what's going to happen. I'm actually going to end it uh, uh, there. Um, we're, we're nearly at 1030. And really, that was a, a message of, of hope um, and uh, one that we don't get so often. So I want to thank you, Rabbi, right. for, for coming and for bringing your message. I want to thank Alara. Americans for right. Peace Now. Thank you and all. Um, people that didn't get to ask questions, I can hang yeah, around for a few minutes. Yes. And maybe I'll just leave with one last thought. Uh, again, it's something that, that people have heard me say. Rabbi Heschel, I mentioned, uh, he often said, in a democratic society, some are guilty, but all are responsible. Amen. Thank you.